Amen. All right, you guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name's Nate. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to the Gospel of Mark. We have been journeying and studying through Mark's story of Jesus as he is taking kind of a first stab, a first crack at telling the story of our king. And along the way, as we've been in this kind of eight-week series in the beginning chunk of the Gospel of Mark, looking at the kingdom story, we've had this, this mural that, um, that uh, Amanda and Eric, uh, Amanda uh, Hill and Eric Holmland have been uh, creating. And each week, it gets a little more beautiful. And this morning, it's really cool because you see, like, Jesus' eyes are open today. Like the, the p- previous weeks, he didn't have eyes. His eyes were closed. And, and so this is, I, I told the first service, this is the most I've ever felt accountable on stage because I feel like Jesus is literally staring a hole in the back of my head as I'm preaching this morning. But I love this morning that the picture we see before us is that we have a king who sees us and knows us. And as we we enter into his story this morning, I just want to pray that we would both, like we would be seen by the king, but also that we would see him more clearly. And so would you pray with me as we prepare to enter into worshiping through God's word? And so Jesus, thank you. Thank you this morning that you are the God who sees us. Lord, that your eyes are opened and your face is turned towards us. Lord, I thank you for um, every saint that is in this room. God, I pray that you would give us eyes to see you more clearly. Lord, that as we enter into a, a few of your stories and we hear how you engage with the chaos of the world around us, God, that it would draw us in to worship. Lord, that we would be transformed and that uh, Lord, if, if any of us is clinging on to things of this world, Lord, the, the chaos that, that maybe we walked in here with, the distractions of our mind, the distractions of our lives, Lord, would you allow us to lay those at your feet? And Lord, as we will see in your word that we would not fear, but believe. And so Jesus, we trust you. We declare that you are king. You are in control. And so may this be your time God, may these be your words, not mine. And Lord, would we leave here a changed and inspired people. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so if you have your Bibles, we are in Mark chapter 4. If you were with us last week, we looked at how uh, Jesus, last week we had the opportunity to really have and enjoy story time with the king that Jesus told a handful of parables. And if you missed last week, I'm going to encourage you to go back. We, we threw the video on Facebook. Go back and listen or watch that video. I'm not going to go too deep into it. Um, I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit. But last week we said, we saw that there's a story that Jesus told that if you don't understand that story, you can't really understand anything else. And then we saw him talk about the kingdom of God and invite his disciples, invite his followers into a deeper relationship, into this, this I'm going to reveal the secrets of the kingdom of God. That was what Jesus was doing last week as we saw the king is in control of his story and he's revealing to his disciples more and more the kingdom of God. And this morning our story is going to pick up literally on the same day that he has been teaching and instructing and opening up these secrets of the kingdom. And so if you have your Bibles, um, and believe it or not, like we're going to actually cover more verses than we did last week. So I hope nobody here has tickets to the air show because you're not going to make it. We're going to be here for a while. Just kidding, but it it is probably going to be a little bit longer of a sermon. So deep breath. We're in this together, but I'm so excited for all the stuff that we get to cover this morning because God's got some cool things in store. And so verse 35 in chapter four of Mark's story is where we pick up He says, on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, being his disciples, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. So let's just pause and have a little conversation. It's it's the same day. The sun is starting to set. Jesus turns to his disciples, and he says, let's get in the boat, and let's go to the other side of the Sea 
of Galilee. We're not going to pack for the trip. We're not going to prepare. Just we're going to take what we've got. We're going to get in this boat and we're going to go across the sea. I want us to see two things. One is I want us to understand for some reason when I picture this boat, I don't know why, but I picture like a small little pontoon fishing boat. That's not the kind of boat that they're getting in. They're getting in a massive like 30 to 35 foot boat that they are familiar with. They know how to use. It's a decent sized vessel that they're going to sail across the Sea of Galilee. And then I also want us to remember who's getting in the boat. These are Jesus' disciples, a handful of whom are fishermen. They're familiar with this, this sea. They've worked this sea. They've sailed across this sea before. And while they've seen Jesus do incredible things and they've, they've watched and witnessed Jesus' power and his presence and seen miracles done, I think when it comes to being on the sea, they feel like they're in control. They've got this figured out. They know how to handle themselves on the open water. They're completely comfortable there. And what Jesus does at the beginning of our story this morning, again, let's read, he says, let us go. Jesus invites them into a journey with him. He's going to get in the boat with them. And while I think they start out trusting and believing that when it comes to the water, they've got it figured out, what we're going to see really quickly is Jesus is going to expose and reveal their desperate need for the king's command in their lives. That even in places where they feel confident, all it takes is a little bit of chaos to unravel their security. And that's where our story goes. In verse 37, he says, a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So they get in the boat, they're headed across the sea and and, and Mark tells us a great windstorm picks up. Now, if you highlight or circle or underline or star or write in your Bible, which I personally would encourage you to do, highlight, circle, whatever, that word great. That's going to be a theme through this first story this morning. This is a a huge, big deal of a storm. This is an incredible storm, worse than anything they've ever seen. And a storm for the Sea of Galilee was not uncommon. The Sea of Galilee sits below sea level and is surrounded by mountains. And so it's not uncommon for the cold mountain air to come rushing down the valley, hit the warm water, and create magnificent, powerful storms. And again, these are fishermen who are familiar with this kind of scenario. It's not new or foreign to them. And so they've sailed through storms before. They've encountered chaos on the waters before, but this time it's something different. This time it's something more powerful. This is a greater storm. This is a greater chaos than anything they've experienced before. And as I thought about it this week, for them, this is a really bad day at the office. You ever had a bad day at work? It just feels like nothing's going right. It feels like everything's against you. And maybe you get to work and you turn on your computer and your files didn't back up. Or you've got nothing but Zoom meetings. Like, that's terrible. Um, or if, you, if you're a stay-at-home parent. Like, I was a stay-at-home parent for, for a number of years. That's actually why I don't have hair on the top of my head anymore. Because there's just those days as a parent where your kids don't listen. And they just fight with each other. And, you know, by noon, you're staring at your watch going, it's got to be 5 o'clock somewhere. Or I need my spouse to come home. Or... Or this is just, it's a hard day and they won't play together and you make them food, but they won't eat the food and they cry because it's not the food that they wanted. And then when you send them to go play with each other, somebody bites somebody or licks somebody and it's just, it's just chaos. Like we've all had those really bad days. This is an extremely bad day at the office for the disciples. It's a familiar situation that is out of control. It's a reality that they would have known and been comfortable in that because of the chaos of the storm feels out of control. And what we're going to see is Jesus is present in the chaos, in the storm, and he's in command in the chaos and in the storm. And so verse 38, Mark tells us Jesus' posture in the midst of the storm it says, he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? 
They're in the midst of this storm. Notice the king's posture. He's cozy, comfy, and asleep. And I wish we had more time. If you want gold stars and extra credit, I'm going to encourage you, go home this week and go to the book of Jonah and read Jonah chapter 1 and reread this story. And then email me the similarities between Jonah and Jesus. And I think one of the things Mark is striving to do here is highlight that Jesus is the far better Jonah. But we don't have time for that. That's just, it's really cool. This is fun homework. If you want to geek out on just how God is telling one story throughout the whole book of the Bible, go read Jonah 1 and reread this story and look for the similarities because there's quite a few. But we see that Jesus is not concerned by the storm. He's asleep. He's comfortable. He's not rattled at all by the chaos of their worst day at the office. He's in command. He's in control. But the other thing I want us to see is that in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of these hard moments, their heart motives are revealed. Look at how they respond to Jesus or what they ask him. They wake him up and they said, do you not care that we are perishing? In the midst of a hard moment, their heart motive is revealed. They doubt the king's goodness. They doubt the king's care. They doubt his love in the midst of a storm. I wonder how many of us in the past year or two have doubted God's love and care because it's felt chaotic. Because maybe we've been in a storm. Maybe, th- maybe, maybe things have been uncertain at work, uncertain at home, uncertain in your marriage, uncertain with your kids, uncertain with just the culture that we find ourselves in. And you are wrestling with, God, are you good? Do you even care? Do you, are you really present in the midst of, of this storm, hard moments reveal our heart motives. And Jesus is going to stand up, verse 39, says, he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So there's a great storm that turns into a great Calm, But I don't want us to miss, this is the king of the universe. Hebrews would tell us that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He was present at creation. He spoke it into existence. The same God that spoke and said, let there be light, let there be sun, let there be moon and stars and land and sea. He turns to his creation again. And this time he says, quiet down, knock it off. And look at how creation responds. There's a great calm. As scary and big as the storm was is how quickly and how eerie it is that like the water turns to glass. The wind instantly dies down. There is an instant obedience to the command of the king. Creation responds instantly. And after speaking to the creation, he's going to turn to the Imago Dei, to the image bearers, the disciples that are in the boat with him, and he's now going to speak to them. In verse 40, he said to them, he's going to ask them two questions. One, why are you so afraid? I think what Jesus is driving at here is is he's really getting to the heart of the problem, which if Jesus is in the boat, the storm shouldn't scare you. If he's with you in the chaos, you should know you're safe. He's saying, why are you afraid? I'm right here. If I'm with you, it's going to be okay. And so he wants them to see, he's got them on this process and this journey into deeper relationship and a deeper understanding of who they are and who he is and the road that they're going to travel. And he wants them to understand that even in the storms, Jesus is with them and you don't have to be afraid. But then he also takes them and he's going to tie their physical reality to a spiritual condition in their heart. The second question he has is, have you still no faith? Now, I personally don't think Jesus is saying this to condemn them or to call them out or to belittle their faith in any way, but rather he's revealing they still have a long way to go that he's not done with them yet. So he says, man, you guys don't have the faith that I'm going to give you 
yet. You're still in process. You still don't get it. And that's okay because he's not done with them yet. And as we zoom back and as we'll see as we continue journeying on through Mark is he's going to continue to take them deeper and part of the process of going deeper is going through the storms of life with Jesus. Having your lack of faith exposed, having your heart motives revealed when life is hard. And Jesus is doing that here. And so he's questioning and saying, when life gets hard, and you doubt me, that reveals you've still got a long way to go. And praise God, I'm not done with you yet. I've still got purpose for you. I've still got patience for you. And then look at their response, verse 41. It says, they were filled with great fear. We had a great storm, worse than anything they'd ever experienced. Led to a great calm, scary calm. And now they're very afraid. I think they have great fear because in this moment they are realizing the one in the boat is more dangerous than the storm, is more powerful than the storm, is more uncertain than the storm. If he controls the winds and the waves, he's sitting in their boat. They're like, holy cow. And the question that has kind of loomed over the book of Mark is, what is our response to Jesus? What are we going to do with this king? And that's the question that essentially they're going to ask themselves. They say, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Jesus is taking them deeper. He's using the storm to reveal their need to grow and their response to the king's command is to say, we need to understand him more. What? I, I think this is a pressing in, not a pulling back from the disciples. They're saying, what are we gonna do with this Jesus? The wind and the waves obey him. How do we respond to that? And so we see in this first story, the king is in command of the physical realities of life, that when work, home, marriage, kids, life around you is uncertain and chaotic, Jesus is still in command, and I want us to see that he's in it with you. He didn't send them on by themselves. He's in it with them. He's in it with you. And so if life has felt chaotic and out of control, Trust that you have a king that is in command. He's there with you. He's not, he's not sent you on your own. He's journeying with you. But then it doesn't stop with just the world around us. We're going to see that really Jesus is after what's going on inside of you, the spiritual reality. And so in chapter five, we jump to another story. They've, they've crossed the sea and chapter five, verse one says, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Let, let's just pause. Like, does this sound like the Bible to you guys? Like, this sounds like a scene from The Walking Dead or a horror movie. This doesn't sound like it should be like Holy Spirit inspired scripture. Yet it is. But this is, this is horrific. What's happening here? This is terrifying. It says that Jesus barely has his feet out of the boat. And from the tombs comes this giant, beastly, naked, smells like death of a man with chains hanging off of him, cuts and bruises and scrapes and dirt all over. And he comes sprinting towards Jesus. And yet Jesus is going to stand there and have a cut. Like if this is me, I'm like jumping back in the boat. I'm like, you guys start rowing. Let's get the heck out of here. Like, there's, there's this giant monster of a man coming at it. Like, I'm done. I'm out. But that's not what our king does. That's not Jesus' reaction. That's not Jesus' response. And I don't want us to miss verse 5. We read it, but I think it bears worth repeating. It says, Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. I think a whisper that we still believe that was, was uttered to our first parents is that God withholds from us and that the world and our flesh and the enemy have a better way 
that we can rebel against God and pursue the things of this world, pursue the things of our flesh, run after those things, and it will be a better life. And the picture we have here of this man, now how much he's responsible for, we're gonna see here in a moment that he is possessed by demons. How much he's responsible for that, I don't really know. But what the picture here is this man is experiencing literally hell on earth, and it's miserable. He is suffering Day and night, he's weeping. Day and night, he's wounding himself because his pain is so deep. And the lie that our parents are whispered in Genesis 3, did God really say, like, he just doesn't want you to be like him, like, take and taste of the fruit. Like, we still believe that. And the picture here of following in the footsteps of the adversary is pain and suffering and misery. It is not a better life. It is not a path towards freedom. The best path is the path that Jesus would have for us. And he's going to continue. Verse six says, when he, this is the, the, the man, saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. He's acknowledging Jesus's authority. He lays in almost a posture of worship before the king and crying out, verse seven, with a loud voice, he says, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? This is the third time in Mark's story that we have seen the demons declare that Jesus is God, that he is Lord. Here the phrase is son of the most high God. He is esteeming and lifting up Jesus as in control, in power, in command. And then he's gonna continue. And again, if you circle, highlight, whatever, this word adjure, we're also going to see the word beg used throughout the rest of this story. This is a significant word. And adjure is very close. He's begging, he's imploring that by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, this is Jesus now, saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. I want us to notice that there is an acknowledgement that Jesus is in command. He's in control. He's, th this man comes to Jesus and starts begging him by the name of God, don't torment me. Because Jesus is trying to get rid of the demons. He's trying to fix the spiritual problem this man has. And then in verse nine, Jesus is gonna take the conversation into a place I would not go. Again, I've already confessed, like if I'm getting out of the boat and a giant, nasty, naked dude comes start sprinting at me like I'm getting back in the boat. I'm, I'm hitting the eject button. I'm not staying around. But even if I did hang out, I don't think my first question or second question would be like, hey, could, could you give me your name? Like, I want to put it on a name tag. Have you been through Belong? Like, maybe you should jump into Belong. That might be the answer to your problem. Like, but, but that's, Jesus says, well, what's, what's your name? He enters into a conversation. And the man replies, or the, rather, the demons reply, my name is Legion, for we are many. Anybody else get like chills in your spine? Like I hate scary movies. If a scary preview comes on TV, like I change the channel. I just, I can't do it. I want to laugh or be mildly entertained or truthfully let my brain check out. I don't want to be scared. I don't get that. If you like scary movies, I'm just freeing up seats for you in the theater. Like I'm just not going to go. I don't want to do it. If like, but this is horrific. Again, let's put ourselves in the scene of what's happening here. Jesus is jumping out of the boat. A dude comes sprinting at him with chains and cuts and bruises and Jesus has a conversation and the man responds with, my name is Legion for we are many. Like, this is scary. This is rough. This is raw. And this is where our king enters in. But, but let's not miss. I want us to, to zoom back for a second. He says, we are this is a legion of demons. Many, many demons possess this man. And so the scene from a spiritual plane, like if we imagine what this looks like in the heavenlies for a moment, you have Jesus on one side. And on the other side, you have a legion of demons, a ton of demons, and they're squaring off against each other. Does it feel like an unfair fight? One against many? It is unfair. This is not an even playing field, but maybe not the way that we would think about it. Because let's look at how the demons engage with the king 
because he's in command. Verse 10 says, he, this is now the man possessed by demons, begged him earnestly to not send them out of the country. Whole bunch of demons on one side, Jesus on the other, and they recognize this isn't a fair fight. He's so much more powerful. He's in command, and so they beg him, don't get rid of us. You have all the power, all the authority. Don't get rid of us. And then the story that's already terrifying, like, gets weird and more terrifying. Verse 11. It says, now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him again. They continued to beg the God of the universe saying, send us into the pigs. Let us enter, in, let us enter them. Verse 13, so he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out, entered the pigs and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. What? Like, Jesus, one, let us notice that in this, when it comes to the spiritual realm, Jesus is in command of that as well. He rules over the heavens and the earth and the demonic forces. They get to do what Jesus says. And so they come to him and they beg him and he gives them permission to go in. I didn't know pigs were a herding animal, but apparently they're, they're, they're chilling on a hillside doing whatever it is pigs do, eating slop, laying around, just waiting to become bacon. Um, and Jesus sends them, the demons, into the pigs. They rush down into the sea and drown themselves. This is a nasty situation, but let's also understand the context. This is a Jewish culture. They weren't supposed to eat pig. That was already an unclean animal. And then it's now dead in the water that they would have gone to to get their cooking water, the water that their kids would have played in, that they maybe would have washed or bathed in. Like, this is a bigger deal, I think, than we recognize. This is a problem that's going to take a while to solve. And so then we see the reaction of the people at this really weird, hard story where Jesus is after the spiritual nature of this man. Verse 14 says, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what, what it was that had happened. I feel like this is an incredibly natural response. First off, like the guys who just had a job taking care of pigs, they're unemployed. They don't have pigs anymore. And so they run away. They're like, well, this was the worst day ever. I'm going to run into town and I'm going to tell some people about this. I got to tell my boss, like, hey, you know how we had, cat, how we had pigs? Like, not, not so much anymore. And, um, and you're not going to believe what Jesus did. And then the natural reaction that I think we all have, right, is, wait, there's something horrible going on? I got to see it. I want to go. And so people flock to where Jesus is to check out the nightmare. But look at the scene that they get to see. This is verse 15. They came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They show up expecting like a gruesome car accident that you slow down on the highway to look at. And they see a coffee date between Jesus and this man because he's not who he used to be anymore. Jesus entered in. He took care of his spiritual problem. He entered into the chaos of this man's soul and he totally transformed who he was. And so now he's sitting and having a conversation. He's in his right mind. This man that nobody wanted to be around, Jesus is now carrying on a conversation, talking with him, engaging with him, and the people are terrified. They don't know what to do with Jesus. I want us to see the disciples were afraid. They had great fear, and their response was to question and press in. The heartbreaking part about this story, to me, is how these townspeople are going to react in their fear. Verse, 17, verse 16 says, Those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. Verse 17, they began to beg Jesus. Look, just like the demons beg Jesus, they beg Jesus to depart. 
in the chaos of this story, their response to the king's command is, Jesus, you're making me uncomfortable. Go away. This should prompt us to pray for our family members and friends and coworkers who maybe are guilty of doing this. This should cause us to check our hearts and go, man, where am I saying, Jesus, you can be in command, but not right here. Right here, I want to hold on to that, and I'm going to push you away. They beg him to leave. And what's really terrifying to me is verse 18. The first half of that verse says, as he was getting into the boat. They're pushing him away, and Jesus is leaving. He's giving them what they're asking for. But there's a beautiful response in this story. It says, the man who, was, who had been possessed with demons begged him. One group is begging Jesus to get away. The other is begging him that he might be with him. This man has been so spiritually transformed. He is a new creation. that He begs Jesus, let me get in the boat. Let me be one of your disciples. Bring me in to the secrets of the kingdom that you're going to show Peter, James, and John. Bring me in. And Jesus, to me, has a surprising response. Verse 19 and 20. It says, he did not permit him but said, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. Jesus says, no. He says, no, you, you can't get in the boat for, with me. I've got a different plan. I've got a different purpose for your story. I want you to go home and share what the Lord has done. And as I read this story this week, I, I found my heart kind of, kind of meditating a little bit and pondering. And, and really, I went to a place where I realized, man, if I had a story like this, it would be so much easier to tell my neighbors. Like, don't raise your hands if your story, but, but like how many of us would be able to say like, yeah, my story involves I used to live in a cemetery and I stunk like death and I never wore clothes and I beat up people and cut myself and then I was possessed by thousands of demons and Jesus showed up and he got rid of them and slaughtered a bunch of pigs and, and now I'm free. Like that's probably not, if it is, come tell me, but that's probably not most of our stories. And I think the temptation that we too easily and quickly believe is that you have a boring story that's not worth telling. But, but here's what I want us to see. At some point, the king entered into your story. I don't care if you got saved at three years old. Like I, I pray that over the kids of this church. I pray that over my children, that they would get saved at a young age, that they would never know a season of not following and feeling the presence and grace of the king. But here, even if you were saved at three, which I believe Jesus does, for three years, you, like Ephesians 2 tells us, you were dead. You smelled like death to Jesus. You were dead in your sin. You were a rebel, undeserving of the king and his kingdom. And for three years, you defied him. For three years, you rebelled. But God made you alive in Christ. That's not a boring story, that you were rescued out of darkness and into light. There is no such thing as a boring story. And I would argue all of us have this same responsibility to go wherever God has us and tell what the Lord has done for us and how he has showed us mercy. We have not gotten what we've deserved. We have tasted grace. We get what we don't deserve. That your story matters and it is not boring. There is no such thing as a boring testimony. And God wants to use your story to put his rule, his command, his reign on display. And when the man goes and does this, everyone marvels. Because your story, his story, all stories matter and an opportunity to point to the king's command. So we see him enter the physical chaos. We see him enter the spiritual chaos. And now we're going to see him enter into the chaos of disease in verse 21. Uh, 
How are we doing on time? You, somebody put a Kleenex box. So I'm just going to assume we got nothing but time since I can't see the time. Verse 21 says, When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Let's just pause. Jesus left a crowd, got in the boat, went to the other side of the sea, went through the storm, taught the disciples a great life lesson, landed on the other side of the sea for one guy was done with that one guy, sent him on mission, got back in the boat, and went back to where they came from. You don't think you matter to Jesus? Look what he just did for one guy that nobody wanted to be with. Every soul matters to the king. Every story matters to the king. Verse 22. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, by name, and seeing him, fell at his feet, Again, this posture of worship and acknowledging the king's authority. We get, you know, we get Jesus interacting with a man possessed by a legion of demons and then the pendulum completely swings to, to hanging out with a religious leader, the ruler of the synagogue, a man of great importance that if he was your friend, if, you, if he knew your name, like you were in good position in the society. Like these are total pendulum swings. But notice that he falls on his face before Jesus and he's going to beg him or implore him earnestly. And I I don't want us to miss what's going on in Jairus' life. As, As the dad of little girls, this story has absolutely destroyed me this week. This is the worst day of Jairus' life. I firmly believe it. Look at what he brings to Jesus My little daughter is at the point of death. He is facing losing a child. And what is his response? To come to Jesus. He says, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. He demonstrates a faith that is beautiful yet incomplete. He believes that Jesus can heal, but Jesus, you have to come with me and you have to put your hands on her. And we've got to hurry because death is coming. And so there's a limit to Jesus's power in Jairus's mind. And while I am challenged that on the worst day of Jairus's life, when he is staring a diseased daughter who's facing death, he runs to Jesus. That's inspiring to me. What we're going to see is Jesus is going to take him on a journey deeper into his power and his command than Jairus could have ever expected, but it's through hardship. And to me, one of the most beautiful verses in this passage is verse 24. It says, he went with him. I love the first part of that verse. Jesus right there, he could have said, let her be healed. He could have snapped his fingers. He could have done whatever. Like, he's the king. He's in command. He doesn't have to go with Jairus, but he chooses to. And I just think about the chaos of what, be, what must be going through as a good dad. Like, I think Jairus is a good dad here. He's concerned for his daughter. He's willing to run to the king, throw himself at the feet of Jesus, and beg him to come and heal his daughter. He's not holding back anything. He wants her to be healed. He's a good dad And Jesus here is saying, I'm going to travel with you through this pain. I'm going to travel with you through this hardship. I'm going to walk with you. You're not going to go through this alone. The end of verse 24 says, A great crowd followed him and thronged about him. I would love for you to just a challenge, like use the word thronged in a conversation this week. I just, that's fun homework for you guys. That's not a word. But it's, there's a chaos of a crowd all around Jesus. The the popularity of Jesus is a huge theme in the story of Mark. And so Mark here is saying there's a great crowd just hustling and, and closing in and creating chaos around Jesus as they travel to Jairus's house. And then we're gonna get now the second time where in the midst of a story, we're gonna get a second story. And I think that the Jairus story is interrupted because on the way, Jesus has an opportunity to make a difference in somebody else's life. And so I think it's kind of just a a sequence of events. But we get this other story of the king's command over disease. In verse 25, it says, There was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years 
and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. This is a woman who has been bleeding and unclean for 12 years. I can't imagine the suffering. I can only imagine the shame. I would think there would be an incredible amount of isolation because the Jewish law would say that a woman, while she's experiencing her cycle, which this woman has had now for 12 years, was made unclean. She couldn't be with her husband or he would become unclean. And even after it was done, there was a process to, and a ritual to becoming clean again. And so I think the suffering here for this woman is a great deal. And while it doesn't sound like it's necessarily life-threatening since she's been living with it for a dozen years, her sorrow and pain is great. And we see that she's exhausted all of her options. She's gone to the doctor she spent every last dime she has. She's tried to get healthy and it's actually getting worse. And so her last grasp at healing is to run to Jesus. But we see even her approach to Jesus here is she kind of wants his healing without giving him her heart. In verse 27, it says that she'd heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. She goes on this sneaky mission to get healed. She wants to be healed. She just doesn't want to encounter the king. So she tries to sneak up behind him and just touch his robe and be healed. And what we see is that's exactly what happens. Verse 29, and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. She's made healthy. But Jesus isn't just after healing the external. He's about the heart. And so just fixing the disease is not going to be enough for the king. And so verse 30 says, Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, uh, out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? I love the disciples' response here. It says, his disciples said to him, you see the crowds pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? They're like, close your eyes and point. Like we're in this, we're in this great crowd. Like everybody's touching you. This is a massive crowd of people. How could we possibly discern who touched you? And yet, verse 32, he looked around to see who had done it. Jesus cares enough about this woman's story to stop everything, to engage with her. He's not okay with just healing the external. He's going to get to the heart and look at her response. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, she's experienced healing, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. The disciples felt fear and they questioned, said, we want to know more. The townspeople felt fear. They were afraid and they rejected. Here, this woman feels fear and trembling and she shares her entire story with Jesus. She holds nothing back. And Jesus' response said, he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed from your disease. He not only heals her disease, he heals her heart. He brings peace to her soul. But if I can, for just a moment, I feel like it's helpful. Like, let's, let's set the Bible over here. I'm gonna come talk over here. I do this often. Like, I think this is helpful as we read the Bible. Like, can we agree Jairus is a good dad? He wants his daughter to be healed. He went and grabbed Jesus and said, come, let, let's, I need you to come and heal my dying daughter. And on the way, Jesus pauses to heal this woman who's sick and then have a conversation with her and enter into a dialogue and hear her testimony. Again, just my sanctified imagination. But if I'm Jairus, I'm losing my mind right now. I'm freaking, like, I just, I just imagine, like, Peter and James and John are holding Jairus back because he wants to grab Jesus and say, no, we've, my daughter is dying. Quit having a conversation and let's get to my little girl. 
And yet Jesus cares enough about her story to enter in, to take the time to bring her healing both to her heart and to her disease. And again, he's got Jairus on this journey where he's gonna show him a deeper and more beautiful glimpse of his power and his command. But it starts with some horrific news. In verse 35, it says, while he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Again, it's the worst day of Jairus' life. He just, lost a, he just lost his little girl. And in his mind now, there's, there's no hope for healing while she was alive, maybe Jesus could have done something, but now she's dead. And so he doesn't know, he doesn't trust the power of Christ any longer. And so his, his servants or the people who've come have said, you know, let, let Jesus be, let's go home and let's mourn the loss of your little girl. But Jesus isn't done. It says, but overhearing what they'd said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, I love this phrase. Do not fear, only believe. I wonder if that needs to be like your mantra, your prayer. Maybe you need to get tattooed on your bicep or maybe something a little less permanent, like put it on your mirror, tape it to your dashboard. Um, how many of us, this needs to be our prayer. Lord, help me not to fear, but believe. In the darkest of moments to Jairus, Jesus tells him, don't be afraid. Just believe. I'm here. I'm with you. I'm not done yet. And so our story isn't done. It says, He allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead but sleeping. They laughed at him. So let's, I know that's mid-verse, but let's just stop. He gets to Jairus's house and he sees people mourning. They're broken over the death of this little girl. And Jesus's response is to ask this question, why, why are you guys sad? She's not dead, she's asleep. He sees a totally different perspective. And in their grief and in their doubt, they mock, they laugh at Jesus. And so I love Jesus's response. It says, he puts them outside. He says, y'all get out. Only mom and dad and Peter, James, and John, you guys get to see what I'm about to do because I'm about to blow y'all's mind. You're going to see a power unlike anything you've ever seen because I'm in command. And so he brings mom and dad. He brings his disciples who last week we saw he's unlocking the secrets of the kingdom. He brings them into the home. In verse 41, they go to where the child is and he says he takes her by the hand. This little girl is the safest she's ever been in this moment because Jesus has her by the hand. Even though she's dead, she's incredibly safe. And then he's going to whisper to her. He said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. You know what Jesus is saying there? Sweetie, it's time to wake up. Like you would maybe wake your kids up on a Saturday. You open back the blinds. You go rub their back gently and say, honey, time to wake up. That's what Jesus does. He's staring death in the face. And for him, it's like waking your kids up to come to church this morning. It's that gentle. It's that tender. It's that caring. It, it, it's that subtle. It's that beautiful. And look at what happens. Immediately, she got up and began walking. For She was 12 years of age. We get how old she is. But instantly, she springs to life. She was on her deathbed. She has passed from life to death. And at the whisper of the king, she springs up from death. There's no road to recovery. There's no rehab. There's no PT. She just gets up and begins going about her business. 
That is the command and the sufficiency of the healing of our king. And what he is demonstrating here is he's not over, only in command over disease, he's in command over death as well. He brings her out of death and into life. And then the response is they're immediately overcome with amazement. Do you think? She was dead and now she's been made alive. And then Jesus says, Mark tells us that he strictly charged them that no one should know this. He says, shh, don't tell anybody this story yet. Now, I don't know how they walk out of the house and justify what just happened. They, they, they figured something out. He says, don't tell people what just happened. It's not time for that yet. And then we get just a little bit of extra information. He says, told them to give her something to eat. Apparently, it's hard work to be dead. And so she woke up a little hungry. She needed a snack, a Lunchable or something. Like she's been dead all day and she needs to eat something. But here's what I want us to see. Jesus is in the process of taking dead things and making them alive. He's in the process of entering into the chaos and showing off his command, his rule, his reign. And so my question for us this morning is where have you been far too focused on the chaos and not focused on the king? Where do you need to take your eyes off of your circumstances and look Jesus in the face this morning? Make eye contact with the Lord and allow him to say, man, don't be afraid, just believe. One of the ways we can take our eyes off of our circumstances, off of the chaos and fix them on the king is by taking communion. So I'm gonna have the praise team come back up. And as we prepare our hearts for communion, I'm just gonna ask you to spend a few moments examining your life, your heart, your chaos, because we all came in here with something that would very easily consume us. Maybe it's the physical reality, your work, your job, or your work, your marriage, your home, your kids, your school, Maybe that's your chaos. And don't get consumed with chaos. Trust the command of the king. Maybe it's like spiritually, this has just been a taxing year, year and a half, and you feel more distance from the Lord. Like how can we fall on our face before Jesus and say, Lord, would you fix what is spiritually broken in me? Maybe you're still dead in your sins and you need to be made alive this morning. And so I would encourage you to take these next few moments and maybe you need to hear from the king, wake up, come alive. Whatever you need to do, I would encourage you, just take this this time, do, do business with the Lord. And then when you're ready, you can come to the communion stations and remember that the king who takes dead things and makes them alive does that by laying down his own life. That the reason we're made alive is because Jesus died. That his body was broken, his blood was shed, and then we get to celebrate that. We get to worship and proclaim that the same king who set us free is coming back to get us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you that You are a king who is in full command. That whatever storms, whatever insecurities, whatever whatever the chaos is that consumes our minds, our lives, our hearts, God, you want to enter in with us. You want to journey with us. You want to go with us. Lord, you don't leave us on our own. And so would you take these next few moments, God, Reveal where we're maybe trying to do too much and would we simply let go? Would we not fear, but believe? And God, would you be glorified? Would you be worshiped? God, would this be a a sweet aroma as we sing and commune with you, as we remember your sacrifice? Jesus, would we be changed and you be glorified? It's in your name we pray, amen. Would you take these next few moments and then when you're ready, you can make your way to the communion stations, grab the elements, head back to your seats, remembering his broken body, his shed blood, and then we'll stand and we'll sing and we'll celebrate our King.